OK, bonjour tout le monde. On va commencer. Euh, bienvenue à la conférence euh, IBIS. Comme vous savez, j'ai envoyé un message dernièrement pour dire que ce serait la dernière conférence de la saison. On va se préparer à, à s'isoler individuellement euh, du groupe. Donc, on va limiter les rencontres euh, à l'IBIS. On va prendre des mesures avant que l'université en, en prenne. Euh, donc, ça va être la dernière conférence. Puis, les conférenciers qui étaient, euh, qui étaient invités pour le reste de la session, on va les remettre euh, à l'automne. Il y a un conférencier qui venait de l'étranger, qui venait de San Diego, qui va être reporté à, à l'automne. Et les autres, il y en avait de, euh, qui venaient de l'Université Laval, de l'Université de Montréal. Donc, on va les remettre à l'automne. Donc, pour la dernière conférence de la saison, on a la chance de recevoir Jean-François Jean Gou, qui est à Mississippi State University aux États-Unis. Euh, donc, il est, il est parti d'un état où il y a très peu d'infections par le coronavirus. Espérons qu'il va avoir un bon, un bon voyage pour le, le retour. Euh, Jean-François a fait un, une maîtrise en informatique. Euh, et, euh, il était à l'Université euh, Paris 7, puis ensuite, il a fait un stage dans un laboratoire où il faisait de l'évolution euh, moléculaire euh, chez Laurent Duret à, à l'Université de Lyon. Et euh, il a pogné euh, la piqûre, comme on dit, pour, euh, pour la biologie, puis il a continué ensuite en biologie. Euh, ses travaux, pour ses travaux de doctorat, il a été un des finalistes du prix euh, Walter Fitch euh, au congrès de 2008 de la Société euh, de biologie moléculaire et d'évolution, qu'il a euh, remporté, donc ça a été le récipiendaire du prix. Euh, pour ceux qui connaissent SMBA, c'est un prix prestigieux dans lequel il y a une compétition entre les étudiants qui euh, finissent leur doctorat. Et, euh, et donc, il avait gagné euh, ce, cette distinction-là en 2008 au congrès de, de Barcelone. Euh, par la suite, il a fait un, un stage postdoctoral avec euh, Michael Lynch en Indiana, où il a travaillé, euh, continué à faire des travaux sur la duplication des gènes, mais il s'est intéressé aussi à euh, la fidélité de la transcription et euh, aussi à la fidélité de la, de la réplication de l'ADN. Donc, il a travaillé aussi un peu sur l'évolution des taux de mutation. Et depuis euh, quelques années déjà, depuis euh, 2018, il est euh, professeur de biologie computationnelle au Mississippi, où il fait, euh, il fait de la recherche, il continue à travailler sur les, les mécanismes de fidélité de la, de la transcription. Et un petit peu encore sur la, la duplication des gènes. Moi, je l'avais invité pour discuter avec lui de la duplication des gènes, comme il y a plusieurs personnes dans mon labo qui s'intéressent à ça. Et comme on connaît plus son travail sur la duplication, ben, je lui ai demandé de parler de quelque chose qu'on connaît moins, qui est euh, l'étude de la fidélité de la transcription. Donc, merci beaucoup d'être venu et euh, on, est grand, on est content de t'avoir. OK, merci Christian. For, uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going to give a talk in English. I'm sorry, I'm switching my brain back and forth between English and French. It's feeling really strange. Um, but uh, when it goes to research, I always have to switch back to in English. Unfortunately, I don't have a switch for my accent. So I hope all of you can understand. Uh, so I'm going to talk about these molecular mechanisms of transcription fidelity. It's um, a very recent project that we've been developing for the past couple of years. Um, I find it very exciting and I hope you will also find it very exciting. So uh, I assume all of you are biologists, so I don't need to remind you about how important um, base pairing is with G pairing with C, A pairing with T, and that this is at the heart of some extremely fundamental processes of biology, replication, transcription, translation, and a few of that we don't always think about. For example, splicing, um, base pairing is going to be important for um, non-coding RNAs to identify the uh, splice sites, also for post-transcriptional gene regulation. And what I'm interested in is what happens when these things go wrong, when uh, the rules of base pairing are not respected. So there's a lot of research on that for replication. And in humans, for example, the uh, error rate for replication is about on the order of 10, uh, 2 times 10 to the power minus 10 per nucleotide per cell division. And that gives you an error rate of about 10 to the minus 8 per generation. So we know the, this error rates for like literally dozens, if not hundreds of organisms. And we know the, the variation in these error rates. We also know a lot about the consequences of these errors. So obviously, we need some of these errors to happen because without mutations, there will be no evolution. But we also know that most of these errors are going to be either deleterious or neutral. 
now the question, the, the, the reason I was really interested in this was what do we know about fidelity of transcription? How does it contrast to the fidelity of replication? Um, and when I started this project, we didn't know much about the fidelity of transcription. There were a few estimates in two or three organisms, E. coli, yeast, <laughs> but really we didn't know much about it. So just to make sure we're on the same page, what I mean by uh, transcription fidelity and transcription errors. So uh, transcription error is going to be simply a difference between the RNA molecule and the DNA sequence from where it was transcribed. And that can have uh, two possible origins. One of them is the RNA polymerase that incorporates the wrong nucleotide during transcription. So for example here, if your DNA template has a G and the RNA polymerase incorporates an A instead of a C. So that would be a, what I call a transcription error. And then you can also have post-transcriptional damage to the RNA. So if the RNA polymerase does a good job, incorporates the correct amino acid, but later on, that can be a modification of this nucleotide and that will result in a difference between the RNA and the DNA. So how do we detect these transcription errors? Well, you can think of a very naive approach, which would be to simply use RNA-seq. If you're not familiar with it, it's a method that is short for RNA sequencing. In reality, we never sequence the RNA molecules directly. We always extract the RNA molecules and make the cDNA with a reverse transcriptase and then sequence the cDNA. So we should call this cDNA-seq in, in theory if we want it to be very precise. But basically it's a method that allows you to, uh, to sequence a large number of cDNAs that come from RNAs. And if there were a, a transcription error, it will appear as a mismatch between your RNA-seq read and the reference genome. So you could you know, download one of the many data sets of RNA-seq that's available um, online. And these are uh, your RNA-seq reads. Here the red bar represents uh, a position where there was a transcription error. And when you align these RNA-seq reads to your genome, the uh, transcription error is going to show us a mismatch between the read and the genome. So that will look something like that. Uh, the genome sequence has a G, you have a bunch of reads that also have a G, and then you have one read that contains the error with an A. Now the reason why I say this is a naive approach is because if you do that, most of the mismatches that you're going to find uh, are actually sequencing errors. The sequencing method that you're going to use whether it is Sanger sequencing, Illumina, PacBio, whatever, they all make mistakes too. And with Illumina, it's going to be on the order of 1%. You could get it down to 0.1% maybe uh, if you filter out only the high quality uh, reads, but still 99.9% .9 of the mismatches between your reads and the genome are going to be the mistakes that were made by uh, the sequencing machine itself. So, um, you know, finding transcription errors in all these sequencing errors is like finding a needle in a haystack. Except that it's actually pretty easy to find a needle in a haystack, right? You just need a lot of time. So, if you're a computational biologist like me, you use a big supercomputer, and you submit a job, let the program run, go drink a coffee or a beer while the program is running, and come back to get the result. The problem here is that we don't know how to tell apart the needle from the piece of hay. We don't have a way to tell which of these mismatches are transcription errors, which ones are sequencing errors. Not to mention the mistakes made by the reverse transcriptase when making the cDNAs. Because remember, we don't sequence the RNA molecules, we sequence the cDNAs. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the solution is to sequence the same RNA molecule multiple times and use the redundancy in sequencing to filter out sequencing errors from uh, real errors that were present in the RNA molecule initially. Um, that's a method that was developed initially 
to um, find very rare mutations in RNA viruses. So that could be some very useful applications uh, these days. We could definitely use that, and we're actually trying now to use that to measure the mutation rate of some uh, RNA viruses. So one of them uh, comes to mind, I think. And I hope I'm not going to be patient zero for Quebec um, for this one. So how do we do that? How do we sequence the same RNA molecule multiple times? So we use this thing called rolling circle. And the basic idea is to circularize your RNA molecules. So these are, uh, this circle is an RNA. And then the reverse transcriptase goes around the circle multiple times to produce these long cDNA molecules, which are tandem copies of your original RNA. I'm gonna give you a little bit more details uh, about how we, uh, we do this. Um, and you can do this, use this method in pretty much any organism you're interested in. All you need is a way to extract the RNA from your organism of interest, and you need to have a reference genome, right? So after um, extracting the RNA, the first step is going to um, slice the RNA in short fragments, and you want your fragments to be between 50 and 100 nucleotides in size. And the reason is we want the fragments to be about one third of the size of the final sequencing reads. And most sequencing technologies give you reads, you know, on the order of 250, 300 nucleotides with Illumina. And that will allow you to sequence at least three repeats of your initial RNA molecule. Uh, and three repeats is what we need to be really confident in, in our calls. So uh, we generate these fragments of uh, RNA molecules. Here the red star represents the position of a transcription error. Then we use a ligase to circularize the RNA molecules. And then um, do the reverse transcription. So whenever you have an error, a transcription error that's present in the initial RNA molecule, is going to be present in every single copy of the long cDNA that is made. So you're going to have these long cDNA molecules that contain these repeats. Then you have to do a little bit of magic by informatics. Uh, find the position of a repeat, uh, generate a constant sequence that you align to the genome. And I'm not gonna go into the details of all the bioinformatics analysis, but I'm happy to answer any question on that at the end. And whenever you add a true transcription error, you're going to find evidence for it by finding the mismatch being supported by every single repeat. So these three um, reads here are actually the three repeats that come from just one read, or this data comes from just one initial RNA molecule. Well, when you find a mismatch, which is supported only by one of the three copies, or just maybe two, it's more likely to be a sequencing error or an error that was made by the reverse transcriptase. Okay, so that's basically how we do that. We find all the transcription errors like that, and then we know how many positions we've looked at by looking at how many times we've align our consensus reads with good confidence across the genome, uh, and that would give us the error rate. Um, so a lot of this data that I'm going to present now was generated when I was a postdoc in the Lynch lab, and I was working with a grad student, Wei Li, uh, Mark Vermerst, who is now at the um, uh, University of Southern California. And um, I actually learned how to do that uh, with these guys. I, come from a purely computational background. Basically, never touch a pipette before. And the reason I mentioned that is to tell you how easy it is to actually do this at the bench. If you want to try it, you can probably do it. If, if I can do it, I'm sure any one of you can. Uh, the other uh, interesting thing is that um, if you've worked with RNA-seq to measure expression level of genes or with microarray data, you know that um, who the person, the person who is handling the data, the, uh, doing the benchwork is very important. You have a lot of variation in expression level 
And a lot of the variation comes from who the person is at the bench. Um, with this, we didn't observe any variation between the three of us. I was scared to death when we did it the first time. I thought my batch of data will be uh, horrible and the data will look like the error rate will be 10 times higher on my batch of data because I would do bad things handling the, the samples. No, um, it's very robust to having bad hands at pipetting. So that's a very good point for this method. Anyways, we generated a ton of data, uh, mostly in yeast. For each sample, we had, each of us was handling one replicate, so one wild type for each of us, one mutant for each of us, etc. So we could check for uh, experimentatory effects, etc. And um, here are uh, the results. We you know, found a couple of hundreds of thousands of transcription errors. Uh, this is a representation of the yeast genome with each dot here, marking the position of one transcription error that we found. So we, we cover the whole genome. That's a nice thing about this method. Um, this is a zoom on one chromosome where you have the coverage. So that's how many calls we can make at a given position, and then how many transcription errors we find at these positions. So we, we have a genome-wide view of transcription errors. The nice thing with that is that we can start looking into more details. Um, a lot of the RNA-seq data is focusing only on messenger RNAs, right? But mRNAs, they make about 5% of the total RNA in the cell. So we looked at all types of RNAs. So the mRNAs, they're made by RNA polymerase 2. And for these ones, we found an error rate on the order of 4 times 10 to minus 6. So that's about, and I'm looking only at base substitution here. That's about one base sub for every 250 nucleotides that are transcribed. And um, it also translates in about one in every 150 transcripts that contain at least one error. Now, some of these errors are going to be at um, synonymous positions. So they might not change uh, the protein coding sequence at all. Others might have um, um, more dire consequences. So you may want to see the glass you know, half full, saying it's pretty accurate, or half empty, say it's not so accurate, especially if you compare it to the DNA mutation rate. Remember, the DNA mutation rate is four orders of magnitude lower uh, than that. Uh, so that's again for human, but uh, in yeast, it's going to be, again, uh, roughly the same difference. That was for RNA poll 2 but uh, we wanted to look also at the RNA molecules that are made by the other polymerases. So RNA poll one which is the one that makes uh, most of the ribosomal RNA. And we were kind of surprised to find that the error rate is very similar both RNA polymerases, even though they're made of a totally different set of subunits, they end up having very similar error rates. Now with RNA poll 3 it gets a bit more interesting. So that's the um, polymerase that makes the tRNAs, the 5S ribosomal RNA, and a um, number of non-coding RNAs like the SNO RNAs, um, some long non-coding RNAs also in humans. And this one, has a much higher uh, error rate. So we're interested in figuring out what are the reasons for, for this. And I'm gonna get into this in a minute. And then there's a, a fourth RNA polymerase uh, that is specific to the mitochondria. And this one also has a um, fairly elevated um, mutation rate. So the nice thing here too is that we can uh, look at the error spectrum, not just the rate, but we can see which type of errors are more frequent than others. And we see that the most common type in both POL1 and POL2 are the C2U errors. So these are positions in the RNA where you expect to observe a cytosine and what we find is a uracil. And this type of errors occur at a rate of about um, one times 10 to minus five. It's the most frequent type of error for both POL1 and POL2. Now, if we look at POL3, RNA polymerase 3, we have a very different spectrum with uh, a polymerase that makes a lot of G to A errors. So positions where you expect a G, you observe an A. And uh, you will see that uh, that is 
quite important for the future. And then the mitochondrial RNA polymerase also has uh, a bias, and this time it's A to G errors that are more frequent. So you wanted to know more about the molecular mechanisms that are responsible for the fidelity of transcription. As I mentioned, the RNA polymerase is a very complex uh, machine. It's made of 12 different subunits. And uh, what we did is we looked at a uh, number of mutants of these RNA polymerases. So here, uh, these are the first three mutants that we looked at for RNA pol 2 We looked at um, complete knockout of RPB9, which is this uh, tiny little subunit in orange here. A mutant that has one amino acid substitution in RPB1 which is the, the main, the largest subunit of the, uh, the polymerase, you can't do a knockout of RPB1. This is lethal without this, there's no transcription at all. And then also a deletion of DST1, which is a general transcription elongation factor. So what we found is that all three mutants had a much higher error rate, uh, with DST1 being the, uh, the one with the highest increase. Uh, so here we have about a uh, tenfold increase relative to the wild type um, transcription error rate. Now the nice thing is that we have a control built in there because these, all these three mutants are specific to the RNA polymerase two. So we should not see any increase in the error rate for the transcripts that are made by RNA pol one for the ribosomal RNA. And indeed, we don't observe uh, any effect on the error rate for RNA pol one So that's a nice control that tells us we didn't simply did something wrong with the processing of the data for the mutants. Now what happens if we start uh, looking at mutants of RNA pol one uh, We looked at uh, knockout of this subunit, uh, RPA12, which is homologous to the RPB9 subunit in POL2. Um, you might notice that some of the subunits are shared between the two, others are not, and um, like RPB9 and uh, A12 are probably very ancient parallels that then but specialized one for RNA POL2 and one for RNA POL1. So when we knock out uh, this subunit of the RNA POL1, we observe a very high increase in transcription error rate, specifically for the reads that map to ribosomal RNA uh, genes and nothing for RNA pol 2 So um, we've done a lot of that. Uh, this is very recent data, so I apologize, uh, the graph is not the, the best. We don't have uh, replicates yet for this data. We just want to have a quick look at uh, more subunits. And we find that um, some of the subunits can be deleted without affecting the error rate at all. Uh, for example, here this RPA14, um, we don't see any difference compared to the wild type, while uh, these two of our subunits do result in an increased error rate. And the type of error that is increased here is specifically G2A. And that was the same thing that we observed for the first free mutant that I mentioned. It's not that these mutants make more of all 12 possible base substitutions. The increased error rate is driven almost exclusively by an increase in G2A errors. So that's really just one type of error that is uh, increasing when we do this knockout and this, uh, this one substitution. There's also a little bit of increase in U2C, but it's really, really mostly the G2A that is driving the pattern. And if you remember, that's very similar to what we observed when we compared the spectra of RNA pol 1, 2 versus RNA pol 3. Some, for some reason, these mutants have um, error spectra that look a lot like the one of RNA polymerase 3. So it looks like RNA polymerase 3 might be missing some of the deleting mechanisms that are present in pol 1 and pol 2, but that we can uh, erase with these knockouts. So what, um, what is so special about these G2A errors? 
Um, so you have to remember a G to A error is going to happen when the polymerase is reading a C in the template and uh, is incorporating an A uh, in the, uh, instead of a G in the nascent RNA molecule. And something we know is that cytosine is very prone to damage, especially cytosine demination. Um, happens in every single organism at a certain rate, especially when the DNA is single-stranded, so during transcription, since you have to open the DNA, that makes it even more um, uh, prone to demination. So one uh, question we have is, is this increased G2 error rate, does it come from the RNA polymerase having trouble um, reading correctly these damaged cytosines? So can DNA damage promote transcription errors? The one experiment we, uh, we did to, uh, to test how DNA damage can contribute to an increased transcription error rate is, uh, and when I say we, I mean, my collaborator, Mark Vermeers, did that at the bench and I did the analysis. Uh, we exposed the, uh, the, the yeast to, okay, methyl nitro nitrosoguanidine MNNG. It's um, a chemical which is, it's known to increase mutation rate. And we've measured by how much uh, in the conditions that we use, typically two to three fold. And it's known to cause uh, mostly this type of damage to guanosines. It makes this N7 methyl guanosines, which are going to pair with uh, T. So in our case, it's gonna be U in the RNA instead of C. So it's been characterized mostly in the context of DNA replication. I want to see if same kind of things happen for transcription. So, what we expect is the cells that are exposed to this, uh, to this drug, that they will have an elevated C to U transcription error rate. It also um, makes two other types of damage. We could result in an increased U to something um, error rate. Uh, I don't know this modified nucleotide, uh, what its base pairing preferences are, but maybe this experiment will tell us. And then uh, another modification to guanosine again, which should result to even more C2U errors. Okay, so here are the results. Uh, so that's uh, again, um, wild type yeast. This is just for messenger RNAs, but we see something very similar for ribosomal RNA. Here we have error spectrum. You can barely see it, but in blue, that's for the untreated cells. And then here are the spectrum for the cells that are treated with uh, MNNNG. And I don't remember exactly what concentration uh, we used here, but I, I can find it if, if you're interested in that. And indeed, what we see is a large increase in uh, C to U errors, and also a little bit of U to C and G to A error rate. So what this tells us is that damage to the DNA can be passed on to the RNA. It can increase the probability of the RNA polymerase to make a mistake to make an error. So now what happens if we um, give the cells a chance to recover? So this time we expose the yeast cells to the drug, I mean an engine. Then after some time, the cells are uh, washed. So uh, we wash away all the MNNG and then get the cells in some new fresh media without any of the MNNNG. And then we uh, measure the error rate after two hours and after six hours uh, during which the, the cells can uh, divide and have time to possibly repair their DNA. So what we observe here for um, RNA pol 2 we see the initial large increase in error rate upon exposure to MNNG. And then after two hours and six hours, and I wish we did a 24 hours time point, but uh, we don't have it yet. We see a pretty quick recovery. The error rate goes down, which tells us that 
what's probably happening is you have an initial exposure to the drug which causes damage to the DNA. New transcripts are made with a very high error rate, but then repair of the DNA, a number of pathways that can uh, repair these damages to the DNA will result in the transcripts being made after repair to have fewer errors. For rna pol one we don't really see the recovery, and um, it's probably because the uh, ribosomal RNAs, they have a much longer half-life. So after six hours, the RNA molecules that we extract are probably still molecules that were made at the time when uh, the cells were just exposed to mn energy before the repair mechanism has a chance to, to operate. So one way to test this is to look at a mutant or uh, one of the DNA repair genes. So in this case, we looked at MGT1, which is um, 6 o methylguanine DNA methylase. So it's one of the genes that we suspect would repair the type of damage caused by MNNNG. And what we observe is that when we knock out this gene, the cells oh, increase in error rate remains roughly the same. But the most interesting difference is that the cells don't recover so much after six hours. So this tells us that a lot of these transcription errors that we observed here come from damage that was made to the DNA. A type of damage that will probably never result in a mutation because most of it is going to be repaired eventually. But there is time between the exposure and the repair for producing a lot of damage containing transcripts. Okay, so um, everything I presented so far was about uh, base substitutions. So we saw that you can, as soon as you poke at the RNA polymerase, uh, whether it's an amino substitution, uh, deletion of one of the subunits, you see an increased um, error rate. We see that a lot of these errors can come from damage to the DNA, especially if the cells are in an environment where there is a lot of damage to the DNA that's happening. And I think it's, it's very important because if we want to measure how toxic a given compound is, typically we like to measure the mutation rate. For example, we want to know if glyphosate is toxic or not, we're gonna to want to measure the mutation rate. But what about transcription errors? Now we have a way to also quantify that. But there's also a whole other type of errors that can be made, and there are the uh, insertions and deletions. When the RNA polymerase either skips a nucleotide or incorporates one too many. So we can also detect indels with our method. And uh, what we observed, again, this is data from uh, yeast, wild type, and when I say yeast, I mean cerevisiae. Um, we observe insertion and deletion rates that are five to tenfold lower than base substitution error rate. That's very similar to what has been observed for uh, DNA replication errors. Typically, the indel rates are about a tenth of the base substitution uh, error rate. All the mutants that we looked at and that had an increased base substitution transcription error rate, they also display an increased uh, indel rate. So the mechanisms that are responsible for the fidelity, both for the base substitutions and for the indels have to be linked. The, the, the two types of errors are linked. Something that we observed for uh, indels, but not at all for base positions, is that the error rate increases uh, very uh, rapidly with the length of the homopolymer track. So if the RNA polymerase has to transcribe a region where you have five or six of the same nucleotide in a row, that's uh, where it's going to make a lot of indels. And um, 
I'm going to finish with um, uh, a nice little story about these indels to look at what the, some of the consequences of this uh, transcription indels can be. So when you have uh, an indel of size one or two, what's going to happen is that probably the ribosome is going to end up being out of frame when after it reaches the position of this indel. If you have an indel of size three or six or nine, uh, it's going to preserve the frame, just skip one amino acid. But if uh, the indels of size one and two and one or two, and they're the most common types, that's going to result in a frame shift. And this frame shift, they tend to create premature termination codons. So the ribosome is going to encounter a stop codon very quickly after that. And we know that the transcripts that contain these premature termination codons, they are quickly degraded by this mechanism, the NMD, for nonsense mediated mRNA DK. So I'm not going to go into the details of how NMD can tell the difference between what a normal stop codon and what's a premature stop codon. But uh, at least in yeast, it's, we can think of it as there's a mechanism that senses the distance between the stop codon and the poly A tail. And if this distance is abnormally long, then the mRNA is recognized as containing a premature termination codon and it is being degraded. So um, if you have a normal messenger RNA that does not contain any error, the stop codon is going to be um, at the end, close to the poly A tail. Normal transcript, it's going to be translated. Now, if you have an indel, a transcription indel that happens um, very early on in the sequence, close to the five prime end, it's going to generate stop, perimeter stop codons um, far away from the poly A tail, and that's going to be a signal for NMD to degrade these transcripts. However, if the RNA polymerase were to make uh, an indel close to the free prime end, it's very likely that the stop codons generated there will be close enough to the end so that uh, it's not recognized as abnormal by NMD. So what we um, expect to see is um, all these type of errors, we're going to see them but this type of errors, there's going to be a depletion in this, simply because we're never going to collect these mRNAs because NMD will have degraded these NMDs before uh, we get a chance to extract them. So here you have the um, indel rate of transcription as a function to the free prime end uh, to the distance of the free prime end of a transcript. So it can be a bit confusing because you have a free prime end on the left side. Uh, so that will be indels that occur very close to the normal end of a transcript, and there are indels that occur much further away. And you see that the uh, indel error rate goes down. So it's not that the RNA polymerase makes more mistake towards the end of a transcript. It's not that the RNA polymerase gets tired or something like that. We think the error rate is actually constant across the whole transcript, but the errors, the errors that happen in this region of the transcript, we're not going to see them because NMD is going to remove all these transcripts because they are going to contain these premature termination codons. And we can test that by looking at a gene that is responsible for uh, NMD, so this UPF2 gene. And uh, in this knockout, now we see a flat, or if anything, the indel rate goes up. So that really tells us that there are large number of indel errors that will be targeted by NMD. And this is um, pretty important for um, the strength of selection on fidelity of transcription. Because if the RNA polymerase has an error rate, an indel rate that's too elevated, then that might saturate the NMD. And the NMD will not be available anymore 
to degrade all the other types of uh, erroneous transcripts. So for example, splicing errors. Whenever an intron is not correctly spliced out, this is the type of transcript that is going to be taken care of by NMD. And we know that transcription error rates occur much more frequently than this type of errors. It's more like 1% of the time that splicing fails. So that is probably some pretty strong selective pressure to maintain the indel rate of the RNA polymerase to a low enough level, in part to prevent saturation of the NMD. Okay, um, so everything I presented so far was uh, data in NIST, uh, sorry, Vizier, but we've now expanded to a number of other model organisms. Uh, we have data in uh, V nematode, C elegans, V fly, uh, Drosophila, and um, uh, the mass, mass musculus. But the main surprise for us was that uh, overall, the error rates, transcription error rates, were very similar for all these species. Like between five times 10 to minus six to one times 10 to minus five, maybe a two-fold variation at max between these uh, organisms. Even though the DNA mutation rates have variation of several orders of magnitude between these organisms. That, that was uh, kind of a surprise to us. The error spectra are also uh, fairly similar between all these organisms. So there seem to be some very, very generic, general trends of um, transcription fidelity. And uh, we're working at expanding things. If I should have put a tree of all eukaryotes, and that's just a tiny, tiny little part of the tree. Uh, but I'm working on getting data in Paramecia, my favorite organism, which would be like far away on the tree, also from plants. So we are, we're working on uh, expanding that. Okay, so um, conclusions. I hope I convince you that uh, this method, the ring circle, it's it's very efficient method if you want to have a genome-wide view of transcription errors. It's very easy to uh, generate the data. The analysis is a bit more complex, but if any of you is interested in generating data in your favorite organism, I'm happy to talk with you. Um, the nice thing about having uh, such large data sets is that we can look at um, transcription fidelity of different RNA polymerases, POL1, POL2, POL3. Uh, we can look at uh, mutants. It's, it's very easy to, uh, to perform this analysis. So the, the main thing we're trying to understand now is what is causing this systematic increase in G2A error whenever we um, do a knockout. I didn't incorporate this data here, but we also have knockouts of subunits of the RNA polymerase in nematodes, C elegans, and we see exactly the exact same thing. Again, it's the G2A type of errors that increases. So that, that's really something, and I, I really would like to um, test very precisely what is the reason for uh, this type of error always uh, increasing. And I think this probably relates to DNA damage and how the RNA polymerase handles the presence of damage in the DNA. So we are really uh, expanding the project into finding the interplay between DNA damage and um, transcription fidelity. Um, one of the future experiment that I'm planning is um, so for the DNA damage part, I'm going to look at uh, mutants that have a UNG1 knockout. So UNG is the uh, cut of the enzyme that is responsible for removing uracil from the DNA. And um, with this experiment, uh, that's going to tell me whether the RNA polymerase is capable of transcribing through an abasic site and whether this type of abasic site could be the reason for the increased G2A error rate uh, in all these mutants. I'm also going to look at uh, whether RNA editing enzymes also cause spurious RNA editing, which will look like additional transcription errors. Um, and one of these types of spurious editing could be cytosine demination. If you have a 
the heminase, it might um, act also on the RNA and increase the um, C2U error rate. So I'm going to look at a couple of mutants that do not have this editing uh, capacity and see if that reduces the uh, C2U error rate. Okay, with this, I just want to uh, thank the people who were involved in this. So a lot of the data was generated with uh, Mark Vermers and Wei Li was a PhD student in the Lynch lab. Uh, we did get some funding through uh, NIH, National Institute of Aging. That was one of the main reasons why Mark was interested in that. We want to see how transcription errors could uh, relate to aging. Um, we're in slightly different ways now. And uh, my current institution, uh, Mississippi State. And, and thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. We uh, thank you for your presentation. So my question is that you said that uh, the, the neuro uh, or transcription may happen because of the DNA mutation, DNA polymerase mutation. And you also work with the four kinds of species from the fly, and the mouse, and the other. So you, you also observe that the ratio of uh, the mutation is quite similar. But how do you confirm that the DNA polymerase is a uh, mutation, same happens with the mutation for all the species in the world? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm following the. Um, and this, uh, you said that the uh, DNA uh, polymerase mutation may uh, is called for the. The, the mutation for the DNA. So, so yeah, we, we know the, uh, the DNA mutation rate for all of its species. Uh, they've been measured with, um, so in, in yeast, the elegans, uh, they've done uh, mutation accumulation lines. In mice, I think most of it comes from sequencing trios, where they sequence the two parents and the offspring and find the mutation. So we, uh, not, not my lab, but other labs have measured the, muta the mutation rates in these uh, species. And, um, and they, they do observe, like I didn't put the numbers here, but um, the mutation rate between some of these species varies by at least two or three orders of magnitude. So do you but, think that is, sorry, do you yeah. think that is the same reason of the DNA mutation, DNA brain rate? No, no, I, so, um, the, the reason I mentioned this was um, the, the lab where I did my postdoc, the PI was working a lot on trying to explain this variation in DNA mutation rates. Like these literally orders of magnitude between bacteria and uh, some eukaryotes in, in mutation rates. Actually my favorite organism, Paramecium, has the lowest mutation rate ever recorded. And I can tell you I have some primary data when it comes to transcription errors, it's exactly the same as yeast and silicon. If anything, it actually has a slightly higher transcription error rate. But that was the motivation initially for this project was to look at the variation in transcription fidelity across these organisms and to see if it was following a, a trend similar to the variation in DNA replication error rate, in DNA mutation rates. And we don't see that at all. So I pivoted more towards the molecular mechanisms of transcription fidelity. Does that answer your question? Good. Thank you. 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 Durant la transcription, les premières bases ouais. sont, sont, sont riches en mutations. Alors, en on, donc, on a observé ça chez les bactéries. Je n'ai pas présenté ça, parce que c'était plutôt le projet de, de Wei. Euh, je ne veux, veux pas marcher sur. Euh, et, et donc, dans, dans, dans ces données euh, sur euh, E. coli, on observe euh, un. un Typique d'erreur de, vraiment au tout début du 5 prime. Par contre, le, sur, sur tous les, les eucaryotes, là, 
c'est euh, plat. Le, le taux d'erreur, euh, on n'a pas observé de différence entre la région 5' et la région 3'. Il euh, y a une toute petite différence. Quand le, le taux d'erreur diminue, euh, augmente un petit peu vers, la, vers le 3', mais c'est principalement à cause de l'histoire des indels que j'ai présenté. Parce il y a aussi quelques euh, substitutions qui vont faire des codes en stop. C'est beaucoup plus, plus rare. Euh, c'est euh, à peu près euh, 5, pour, même pas 5 Enfin, ça dépend du, du taux de GC, etc. Euh, donc, il y a certains types de, de substitutions qui, qui peuvent faire des codes en stop. On voit que ça, ça diminue un peu. Mais sinon, euh, globalement, c'est assez plat. On a aussi observé très peu de différences entre les... Euh, euh, les gènes très fortement exprimés et les gènes faiblement exprimés. Euh, une toute petite différence, mais, mais vraiment minime. Euh, les gènes très fortement exprimés ont peut-être un niveau d'erreur un petit peu plus faible, mais je ne suis même pas convaincu que ce ne soit pas simplement un biais systématique de, de, de la méthode. Donc, euh, on met, chez les bactéries, il y a peut-être un, peut un petit signal. Euh, je n'ai pas trop prolongé, je voulais laisser le oui, euh, laisser... Euh, son projet et pas, pas, pas lui voler son projet. Donc, hein, je n'en sais pas plus. Là, je, je crois que son papier n'est pas encore sorti. Donc, hein, je... Merci beaucoup pour la conférence. Je ne suis pas un expert en le. Moi non plus. <rire> On est fait pour ça. Non. Non. Euh, concernant la transition G1 que ouais. vous avez observée, chez les bactéries, les cytosines peuvent être fréquemment méthylées et ça, ça peut permettre un appareillement de ces Est-ce que les cytosines peuvent être méthylées chez les levures? Alors, si vous voulez, ça s'intéresse presque à Christian et ça, ça pourrait avoir une conséquence sur votre euh, fréquence. Et, donc, de, de ce que j'ai lu, là, tu me corriges si, si je dis des bêtises. Euh, la levure, c'est révisé, supposé être assez bizarre et sont censés justement pas avoir de méthylation des cytosines. Mais euh, il y a des papiers qui disent que ça peut arriver à un, à un niveau assez faible. Pas de méthylation comme chez les, les humains, où il y a des, des séquences spéciales, des promoteurs, etc., qui vont être, euh, ou des, les, les, les CPGs, qui vont être euh, euh, hyper méthylés. Euh, ça, ça n'a pas l'air d'être... Euh, Ce n'est pas, pas quelque chose qu'on observe chez, chez la levure. Ceci dit, euh, il doit y avoir un certain niveau de, de, de méthylation de base euh, qui n'est pas forcément fonctionnel, comme, euh, comme chez les mammifères. Euh, J'ai vu des, différents papiers qui donnent des estimations très, très différentes. Euh, pour ça, je ne sais pas si tu as une opinion plus tranchée que moi là-dessus. Bon, Il n'y a pas les enzymes spécifiques. Pour elles. Pardon Il n'y a pas les, les méthodes de transférence qui font ça. Normalement, elles ne sont pas là, mais ça se peut qu'il y ait un, un niveau de méthylation de base qui soit... Je, je sais que, par exemple, il y, y, y a plusieurs papiers qui ont essayé de mesurer à quelle fréquence on détecte de l'uracile dans, euh, dans l'ADN génomique. Et donc l'idée, c'est que l'uracile vient probablement de... Euh, il va y avoir une méthylation de la cytosine d'abord, et ensuite, euh, ça, ça provoque la démination, etc., et on arrive à une uracile. Et honnêtement, les, les papiers, euh, ça, ça varie de 0,1% à 10%. Euh, enfin, c <rire> il y a différentes méthodes qui donnent des, des résultats très, très différents. Donc, je soupçonne qu'il doit, doit y en avoir un peu. Je veux dire, elles ont euh, l'uracile glycosylase. Donc, il doit y avoir au moins un petit peu de, de ça, mais il n'y a pas de méthylation fonctionnelle, euh, en tout cas. Une question J'en ai une. Est-ce que ce serait possible Je pense je pense que les effets seraient assez forts, mais ce serait possible que la. Les polymérages chez, euh, chez l'humain, la souris, euh, la drosophile, chez les, les espèces où le taux de mutation est plus élevé que chez les bactéries, fassent plus d'erreurs, mais que les mécanismes de surveillance comme le NMD soient plus efficaces. Donc la balance est la même, mais. Um... Étant, étant donné le splicing qui est plus important, ça pourrait mettre une pression plus importante sur la surveillance des erreurs. Donc la... ah, que, ça, pourrait être un mécanisme, ça pourrait être un mécanisme de, de sélection à. à... Surtout, donc, donc, je, je vois bien ça jouer sur le taux d'erreur d'insertion de, des lésions. Pas assez pour, les... Euh, pour les, les, les substitutions, euh, pour les nucléotides substitutions, je ne pense pas que ça puisse vraiment être assez important. Euh, ce, qui, 
ce qu'il faut garder en il ne faut pas perdre de vue que le, euh, le taux d'erreur globalement de la transcription, il est euh, à peu près mille fois plus élevé que le taux d'erreur de, de la réplication. Et c'est probablement parce que les, les transcrits ont une, une durée de, de demi-vie qui est assez faible. Donc les erreurs, elles ont des conséquences qui ne sont pas forcément énormes parce qu'il va y avoir dans le pool de transcrit, il va y en avoir un qui, qui, qui se va être correct euh, de temps en temps au moins. Euh, donc, euh, les, 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 les pressions de sélection vont être très différentes. On s'attendait quand même à voir, euh, à voir une plus de différence entre les espèces. C'était clairement une surprise. Euh, Est-ce que ça pourrait être euh, Est-ce que la, la saturation du, NM, du NMD est vraiment important pour, euh, pour ça C'est possible. Tout. D'accord. Merci tout le monde. Merci. Merci.